our State House studio in Montgomery. I'm Todd Stacy. Welcome to Capitol Journal. The Alabama Legislature met for the 20th and 21st days of the 30-day session this week. That leaves us with nine more possible legislative days that the legislature can meet over the next month. The big news this week is that the budgets are moving. We'll start in the Senate, where the general fund budget was taken up and passed on the Senate floor. This is the spending plan that funds the range of non-education state agencies. Let's take a look at some of the high points of this proposed general fund now on its way to the House. It totals $3.3 billion, a record high amount. Most agencies got slight increases or level funding. $207 million will fund Alabama's court system. $733 million goes toward the Department of Corrections. $128 million will fund the Department of Public Health. $140 million for the Department of Human Resources. $124 million for ALEA. $235 million for the Department of Mental Health. And the biggest expense, $955 million will fund Medicaid. There was also a supplemental spending bill traveling alongside the budget. This is from unanticipated revenue that can be spent this fiscal year. It's $215 million total, including $150 million set aside for the prison construction project. That's $50 million more than Governor Kay Ivey suggested in February. There's $20 million for a parking deck near the new state house under construction. $15 million for the State, in state Industrial Development Authority for site development. That's less than the $25 million Ivy proposed. $5 million for the Department of Veterans Affairs. $4 million to the Alabama Department of Mental Health. And $3 million for security and building upgrades at the Capitol. Again, this is one-time money spent this year. Senator Greg Albritton, who chairs the Senate General Fund Budget Committee, credited procedural changes and the legislature's conservative approach in recent years for the state having a healthy budget. I'm proud of the way Alabama has handled its funds over the last number of years. Uh, we've made some hard, hard decisions over year on, from, from 11 through 15, 16. Uh, the savings accounts we've set up, the, the procedures of not trying to spend every dime, trying to uh, put caps on what we can adjust so that we can't just make up numbers. We've made huge steps in that regard, and that's why we're having uh, surpluses, is because we've been careful along that. Most people don't see that, but we've gone from being broke every year to the point that we have excess funds, and we are capable of exercising control overspending that. We've gotten to a good place with Alabama's budgets, Alabama's fiscal health as a result of being conservative. We can't lose that motion because down times, down elements of our economy will come eventually. We've got to be well prepared to be able to deal with that. I think if you look at some things that have been very popular that this general fund has highlighted, Alabama's got quite a bit of resource that's been in the bank. We've earned a lot of interest income. That's been a great boost to the overall numbers within the budget. However, if interest rates go down, then that will not be nearly as robust as it's been. So we've got to be real cognizant of what's not only making wise choices for today, but know what's coming in the future. The Education Trust Fund budget and related bills moved through the House Education Ways and Means Committee this week. This is the spending plan that funds the range of education services in Alabama, from pre-K to higher ed. Let's take a closer look at what this budget funds. It totals $9.3 billion for fiscal year 2025. That also would be a record. Of that, $5.3 billion is dedicated toward local K-12 schools as part of what is known as the Foundation Program. $1.6 billion goes toward the state's colleges and universities. $586 million goes toward the Alabama Community College System. $681 million goes toward the State Department of Education for its various programs and $200 million goes to the Department of Early Childhood Education, which runs the state's first-class pre-K program. The committee also passed an updated supplemental spending bill. This, again, is from unexpected revenue that will go toward this fiscal year. That bill totals $651 million. $109 million goes to local school boards for things like the Student Information Management System, new bus purchases, textbooks and supplies, and funding for school nurses. $63 million goes to the Department of Education 
for programs like summer reading camps and other literacy efforts, college and career readiness grants, the American Village Capital Projects, and charter school capital facility grants. $30 million will go toward the Lieutenant Governor's K-12 Capital Grant Program, and $50 million will go toward the new Choose Act tax credits for education savings accounts. And finally, the bill funding the Education Advancement and Technology Fund. This is money dedicated toward school improvements that can include tech upgrades or even security upgrades. The bill was introduced, uh, the bill was increased to $1 billion. Of that, $726 million will go toward K-12 schools and $273 million will go toward higher education. Those bills will be on the House floor on Tuesday. Many were watching the Senate this week to see whether they would act on the request from the House to form a conference committee on the gambling package. The two chambers passed vastly different gambling plans, and Senate President Pro Tem Greg Reed said the conference committee will likely happen when lawmakers return on Tuesday. The definition of where the chambers are can only be evaluated based on that the two bills, the Senate bill and the House bill, were very different. Uh, I'm very comfortable with the Senate bill. I think we did some things that were very different, and I think that's what our members were looking for, so I'm very happy with the bill. But I've made a commitment already, and we'll say it again, the bill is going to come out of the basket. There is going to be a conference committee, and that committee can do its work and negotiate, which is the, the process, and then come back to both bodies and determine where we go next. Look, I'm no gambler, all right? <laughs> uh, I think it's a poor investment, but uh, we have it extensively in the state, and we've got to get a control of this. We've got to get it regulated, but evidently the legislature is not in agreement with me on that. So if we don't have the regulation, then we're not going to have the taxation, and if we don't have the taxation and the regulation, uh, we get no revenue from it, and we just have to watch it grow. Also in the Senate, more talk about medical marijuana amid frustration from lawmakers over the delays facing the Medical Cannabis Commission. Capitol Journal's Jeff Sanders has more. Amidst ongoing legal disputes between the Alabama Medical Cannabis Commission and a group of applicants vying for an integrated license, Senator Tim Meltzer, the architect behind the initial legislation three years ago, hopes to create a solution to the impasse. You know, this goes back to the old joke, you got one job and you blew it. Well, the commission had one mission and they have not executed. Melson, along with uh, Senator David Sessions, both passed separate medical cannabis bills out of committee. The focal point of the issue lies in the allocation of integrated licenses, currently capped at five, which encompasses the ability for companies to cultivate, process, and distribute medical cannabis. A lot of discussion among representatives for certain companies that were saying some companies that were awarded should not even have been awarded. So Sessions' bill happens. would increase the number of licenses to 10, while Melson's version would change how the licenses are awarded. Melson wants to involve the Alabama Securities and Exchange Commission in vetting applicants. And let's just start it. Make sure it's a fair process again, and that's what we all wanted from the, from the beginning. There's complicated financial documents and very complicated business organization documents that we believe they are best fit to, to look through. And I just think it's a, a good, clean way to try and get this program going. It's just right now it is, um, unfortunately, I hate to say it's just a mess, but it's just a mess. I mean, uh, this should have been established a long time ago. It should be up and running, and I'm just trying to, uh, to get it back on track. Both Melson and Sessions say they will continue discussions on the issue with the hopes of getting a vote on a new cannabis bill on the Senate floor by the end of next week. For Capital Journal, I'm Jeff Sanders. The House this week worked through two long days of legislation on the House floor. As always, Capital Journal's Randy Scott was there to follow it all and has a report on the highlights. The people's business is keeping lawmakers busy. Items such as House Bill 111 seeks to add clarity to the gender identity conversation. This HB 111 is a definitions bill. It codifies the time-honored definitions of male, female, man, woman, boy, girl, mother, father, and sex. We still ought to have some clarity in your bill. 
as to how these people will be defined. Yeah, my because bill does not go that far. Your, it doesn't. My bill does not and if, define and if anything. We're trying to make sure people are treated fairly. Discussion around House Bill 359 centered on improving mental health guidelines in Alabama. This bill will deal with that by adding definitions to co-occurring substance use disorder and substance use disorder, and it adds reference to serious mental health to the definition of mental health. Far too often we see geographical boundaries like county lines as a hindrance to the process for our probate judges. This bill will also address that. A series of agendas with a wide variety of bills is what's facing the Alabama House of Representatives this week. From gender definitions to high-tech crime fighting, there's no downtime for the lower chamber. House Bill 4 addresses observing Juneteenth as a holiday in Alabama. For me to finally get it recognized, number one. Uh, for so many years, it hasn't even been recognized here uh, up until I think Governor uh, Ivey started at least giving the proclamation, but under the law itself. So that's significant. Representative Matt Simpson's House Bill 345 sets new rules for drones operating near prisons. If we can do something to help prevent drones from being used to drop that contraband behind the lines of the prison, they thought that would be able to help. House Bills 111, 359, 4, and 345 all pass. In the State House, Randy Scott, Capitol Journal. The House also took up legislation requiring public and private institu institutions of higher learning to report any funding they receive from foreign countries of concern or entities associated with those countries of concern. House Bill 330 from State Representative Matt Woods comes in response to reports of billions of dollars from Middle Eastern countries funding special programs or professorship, professorships at American universities. Some have argued this has led to more radicalization on campuses today. Each public institution of higher education that is already required by federal law to annually report funding received from certain foreign sources to the National Science Foundation and the United States Department of Education to report the same information to the governor and the Education Policy Committee chairs in the House and Senate. These reports are intended to provide transparency regarding funding received from foreign countries of concern and certain entities and individuals associated with those countries. I know we've indicated there are some concerns. Are you, any, could you, are you able to provide any specific concerns relative to? Yes, ma'am. You know, as we mentioned earlier before we got called down, there's a lot of colleges across the country back a, a few years ago who were not complying. And it's my understanding that that still could be the case with uh, federal reporting requirements under the Higher Education Act. Okay, so they were not complying with the request from the federal government? Correct. And I'm not saying that about universities here in the state, but there are examples in the country that where that's happened back in 2020 specifically. I can give you some you, of them. Yeah, examples. would you, do you mind sharing with sure, me what you sure. have? Well, one of the probably most profound uh, examples that I came across was the country of Qatar. They provided over $4.7 billion of funding to universities over the last 20 years or so. Uh, that country is obviously very well known to be a you know, very pro-Hamas, anti-Semitic country. Uh, and they funded the uh, Yale University, Harvard University, Northwestern, Texas A&M, and several others to the tune of about $4.7 billion. Billion? It's billion. That bill passed unanimously and now goes to the Senate. News on the election front. Alabama Secretary of State Wes Allen this week sent a letter to the Democratic National Committee warning that, if nothing changes, President Joe Biden could be left off the November ballot. That's because Alabama's nomination certification deadline is August 15th, four days before Biden is expected to be officially nominated by the Democratic National Convention. The state has been in this situation before, actually. Back in 2020, it was Republican Donald Trump that was at risk of being left off the ballot because of the same issue. Then the legislature intervened and granted a provisional exception. Legislation has now been filed in the State House to do the same thing in this situation. And Senate President Pro Tem Greg Reed said it's only, a f only fair to allow equal access to the ballot.
I made an accommodation at the end of the day to make sure the bill could get introduced. I've not read the bill. I don't know exactly what they're asking for, but the idea that we would look for a level playing field for everybody involved in the election process is probably something that I would support. I think it's an attitude that we have to be cognizant of. Again, I don't know the details of what they're asking for, but uh, I did want it to have an opportunity to be introduced today. The Senate Education Policy Committee advanced legislation meant to better define the role of assistant principals in public schools. House Bill 22 from Representative Mark Gidley is meant to empower school administrators to improve discipline and instruction. Statistics tell us that most of our incidents that happen happen in elementary middle school, but it's where most of our schools do not have that assistant principal unit. And with increased responsibilities on our principals and also when the principal is absent with no designated person in charge, it makes it very difficult for teachers to do their job, it makes it very difficult for instructional time to be the focus, and also teacher retention, I think, is a very important part of this as well. I, I, I tried to read the education budget in the House that came out of the House, and I think it, they'd moved the number to like 300 students mm -hmm. for assistant principal, and I'm not sure what the amount of funding was, though, but fiscal note for doing what you wanted to do was $54 million. We're putting $100 million over in the Choose Act. 400. 400, thank you. Thank you, that's what it's gonna mean. So I don't understand this. We also need about that amount of money too to help our kids beyond third grade with reading, I understand. We, it's, something's gotta happen, because I, I am tired of seeing children who are going to the public school system not getting what they deserve in this state of Alabama. News from beyond the State House this week. An Irondale man was arrested and charged with detonating an explosive device outside the Attorney General's building across from the Capitol. You'll remember this incident took place a few months back over a weekend when the building was unoccupied. Kyle Calvert, a 26-year-old, was indicted on two counts of malicious use of an explosive device and possession of an unregistered destructive device. These are federal charges filed by the U.S. Attorney for the Middle District. Attorney General Steve Marshall said he and his staff are breathing a sigh of relief that the, per per that the perpetrator was caught and that he hopes justice will be served. And we've been covering the topic of ethics in a legislative effort to reform the state's ethics code. It looks like disagreements over that legislation has led to the resignation of an Ethics Commission member. Stan McDonald announced this week that he would resign from the Ethics Commission after a recent radio appearance revealed that he had inadvertently broken the ethics code by contributing to political candidates. McDonald was making the case that legislation from State Representative Matt Simpson goes too far in limiting the commission's reach. McDonald apologized for the mistake and resigned, saying, quote, my breach was unintentional, but I know it's right to own my actions. I'm grateful for the opportunity to have served, and I remain committed to the rule of law and our fine system, end quote. This week, Alabama Public Television was proud to honor this year's Young Heroes. Each year, APT honors a group of high school students who have demonstrated academic excellence, active participation in their community, and the courage to persevere in the face of adversity. We held a dinner Wednesday night with members of the legislature where we heard the students' incredible stories, and I have to say, they were nothing short of inspiring. This year's young heroes are Madeline Doster of Enterprise, Philip Moss of Estavia Hills, Patricia Orsi and Catherine Orsi of Wetumpka, Clara Parker of Tuscaloosa, and Caitlin Shaneyfell of Gunnersville. The students receive a $10,000 scholarship for the school of their choice, a laptop computer, and other prizes. I actually welcomed the young heroes here in our studio on Wednesday to talk about their achievements. I encourage you to watch that segment on our YouTube channel. Just go to YouTube and search Capital Journal. Congratulations to these students and best of luck as you attend college this fall. When we come back, I'll be joined by Senate Minority Leader Bobby Singleton for a discussion about several state house issues, including gambling and workforce development. Later in the show, I have interviews with the two Republican candidates in the runoff for Alabama's 2nd Congressional District, Dick Brubaker and Caroline Dobson. You may remember I interviewed the Democratic candidates two weeks ago. You can find those interviews on our YouTube channel as well. We'll be right back.
You can watch past episodes of Capital Journal online at video.aptv.org. Capital Journal episodes are also available on APTV's free mobile app. You can also connect with Capital Journal and link to past episodes on Capital Journal's Facebook page. And you can listen to past episodes of Capital Journal when you're driving or on the go with Capital Journal Podcasts. Welcome back to Capital Journal. <clears throat> Joining me next is State Senator Bobby Singleton, Minority Leader for the Alabama State Senate. Mr. Leader, thanks for coming on the show. Thank you for having me again, Todd. Well, it's been quite a session so far. You're a little more than two-thirds of the way through, and man, that first half was really something. We've talked about that, but what's it been like from your perspective uh, as Minority Leader? You're on the floor a lot, you're at the mic a lot, trying to kind of play defense a lot. But what's been your perspective on the session so far? Well, you know, I, you know, outside of the first half, I think that, you know, we're going into some uh, bills that we can help the state of Alabama. I think that we're now focusing on how we can move the state forward. And, you know, it's been tiresome and it's been hectic. But at the end of the day, you know, the goal is to move the state forward. And that's what I'm still trying to stay focused on. Y'all moved <laughs> the general fund this week. You feel good about where the general fund is? I mean, it has more money really than ever because of these interest rates that are uh, bringing in revenue. Yes, it did. You know, when we're still looking at about $955 million that we were dealing with Medicaid. We have prisons that we're dealing with. Uh, and I think that we did a great job in terms of the money coming from the SSUT tax that uh, coming in. Uh, and so with that, we've been able to stand that budget up to where that budget used to be in a deficit. So I feel, feel good about where we're moving with the general fund. I think the chairman has done a great job in navigating through that and making sure that all of the agencies get fund. Some people got cuts here and there, but at the end of the day, I think that we're still being able to function in our agencies and move forward. Mm -hmm. Well, I wanted to ask you about the issue of workforce. You mentioned mm -hmm. issues that really aren't partisan, really just meant to help the whole state workforce would probably fall into that category because we've talked about it before where you know we have low unemployment which is great news but mm -hmm. also low participation meaning for one reason or another folks are choosing not to go look for a job we've talked about barriers you know what, what's keeping you from going and, and getting that job so y'all have got these the slate of bills aimed at sort of removing those barriers. Talk about that issue and your particular bill. Well, Alabama Works is, you know, coming from the governor's office, I want to applaud uh, Governor Ivey for her vision in terms of trying to move this forward, along with Lieutenant Governor Ainsworth, uh, working with small business and, and, and working with workforce. Workforce is pivotal in this state. You know, if we're going to be competitive with other states, we got to make sure that we have a good trained and educated workforce. So we put together a group of bills that will allow all of our workforce to come under one umbrella. Right now, we're a workforce like this in terms of this, so we're bringing workforce right here. Mm -hmm. So we could be able to take it as a cabinet position, look at workforce, where those dollars are going, and making sure that we get a return on our investment. We could be able to capture that, see where, these, where this money is going. Um, we also have in those old bills like child, uh, child uh, care tax credit, mm -hmm. you know, for those working mothers who left for COVID, went home with their kids, and maybe not returning. So we're saying, hey, to those companies, we'll go out, put daycare in at your work so that mothers can be able to take care of the child, not to pay some external daycare, but if you could put it in at the job so where they can see their babies on a, on a daily basis, uh, we think that that concept can work. So we've been seeing that work in other states, and this bill will help with that in terms of credits that they can get also. Mm -hmm. You know, we're looking at uh, bills that will bring together an organization, you know, under the Department of Labor and Commerce that put together to address workforce and how we are looking at uh, bringing in our people. We're looking at a, a piece of legislation in there that will allow every high school student to be able to receive a credential once they graduate from high school to be able to go into the workforce. It would almost be like having a work, a work degree and credential. That doesn't keep a kid off of the track if they want to go into a two-year, four-year college continue that. But for those kids who are not going to go to college, maybe not go to the military, and are going to be out there looking for jobs after high school, we want to give them a credential that they can go. In high school, they will get some training, you know, advanced manufacturing, you know, forklifting, you know, all kinds of things, plumbing, different Is things. Is that the that, career pathways? Ca career yeah. pathway piece. And so with that, they can move into a job and be able to, to go and make sure that they're gainfully employed. 
Um, we also have what we call innovation district. That's a piece that I'm, I'm called. I'm, okay, I'm yeah, happy. so that came up this week. It had some uh, pushback on it. Yes, you had cities and counties, um, other organizations that had some pushback because you had issues like intimate domain. Can these districts take our property? Can they take private property from people? And people was concerned about that. There was some legitimate concerns. So we were able to sit down, come up with a substitute. And so we have a substitute that we'll probably be introducing in the next legislative day when it comes up. Um, we might not have all the kinks worked out. I think we're about 90% of it, which will give these cities and counties more tools in their toolbox when they're recruiting industry within their own boundaries of their counties or the boundaries of their city. This will allow two or more counties or two or more cities to join together to do a innovation district to be able to bring industry in there. It has some tax implications, whether or not we can be able to, to, to do our own taxing. And I think a lot of that is going to be cleared up. You know, there was some question of whether or not can Birmingham set up an innovation district in Mobile? And that's what some of the cities, if they thought language would allow them to do that, that is not so. I think that we're clearing all that up, we're getting there, but I think this is a great tool in the toolbox that cities and counties can be able to uh, bring industry in that area without abating away all of their taxes. Usually a county or city only having a tax abatement to where they can give an industry when they come, but this is another tool in the toolbox to where we can be able to work with, with industry as they come in our community. It's interesting. <laughs> it's interesting to see these bills moving, the issue of workforce, because we've been talking about it really for the last couple of years. A lot of, lot of um, people, a lot of leaders all on the same page on this, so it's really interesting. So we talk about child care, we talk yeah. about housing, mm -hmm. other barriers to the workforce. It always strikes me though, you know, when we when we ask folks barriers to the workforce, they often cite health care too. Yes. And so I know there's not a specific bill in here dealing with health care, probably because there wouldn't be widespread agreement on that. But we'll talk about that. Maybe, you know, the goal of expanding access to health insurance because that is also a barrier to folks entering the workforce. It really is. You know, and we want to make sure that when people go in that they're getting gainfully employed with these industries that have insurance. Hopefully that all these uh, uh, industries that's getting incentives to come into the state will be giving their employers insurance. Mm -hmm. You know, if we expanded Medicaid, and I, I guess that's a bad word around here sometimes, expansion of Medicaid, you have 300,000 Alabamians that are out here working every day is not covered by insurance. And so we want to make sure that those who are in the workforce and when they come back into the workforce, that they can have it. So especially in rural areas, rural hospitals are closing down. You know, telehealth will help. You know, we can make sure that people have access to a doctor, whether it's by phone or whether it's by uh, in visit, you know, so we just need to make sure that healthcare is a top priority as we bring on these new industry, as we look to it. And so we're going to get there. I think we are going to get there. Okay. Well, I want to move on to one sticky issue and that's gambling. Gambling. So, okay. We, the House passed a pretty expansive comprehensive bill. Senate passed a pretty scaled back version of that. House says, okay, we want to go to conference. Uh, the Senate has not yet agreed to that conference committee, but I think I heard you say that that's coming. Yes. I, I spoke with uh, President Pro Tem Reed. Leader Reed uh, has given me a guarantee that it will come out the basket. Uh, once it comes out the basket, the next legislative day, then we will appoint a conference committee. That conference committee would then go and meet with the House conference, conferees, and the six of us will sit down and we come up with a bill. We can either come up with a bill that and, and concur with the bill that was passed out of the Senate, or we can come up with a hybrid of what was done with the House and the Senate, or we can come up with something brand new, mm -hmm. you know, and bring back to both bodies. It'll go back to the House because the bill originated in the House for them to be able to concur or or, or not to concur with what we come out of conference to accept our conference a report in or and then it will have to come to the Senate as whether or not they would accept our conference report. Mm -hmm. And so that's what we're looking forward. I think that we got time. We will have what about eight legislative days left and it gives us an opportunity to go into conference, come up with something that I think we can put it on the streets and allow the people to vote on. Mm -hmm. I've said before on this show, you know, conference committees happen all the time. I mean, just a very common legislative um, process. But this is a little different because the House and Senate are so far apart on what they want. And th there seems to be, you know, this feeling, at least in the Senate Republican caucus, that, hey, you add anything in there more and we're going to peel off votes, but peel off yes votes, making it hard to pass. What's your sense of how, how much 
can be added from the house? Like, because obviously the house wants much of its bill added back. How much would be too much that would end up not fail, end up not passing in the Senate? You know, Todd, I wish I could really answer that question for you. You know, I have some ideas of some things that I want to see in there, but I'm willing to sit down with the six of us together. If I'm, well, let me assume that if I'm on the conference uh, committee. I'd say there's a so, pretty good chance of that. <laughs> but the six of us will sit down together. We'll try to work it out and see what we can come up with. I think that, you know, we can move the needle here or there. I think that there's, you know, there's some room to be able to do so. And I'm willing to at least give it a try. Even if it come back and senators vote it down, I'm willing to at least give it an opportunity. You know, because, you know, the conference is what I call the sausage making committee. This is where the sausage is made, you know, and a lot can go on in conference. And so I never give up on the process. This process, you know, this legislative process, it'll go down to the last day, the last minute of the last hour yep. and things will break and it will pass. So I don't ever give up on this process. So in as much as people say today that they don't, we may come up with something tomorrow that they can agree on. Until then, I think we can change some minds and I want to give that an opportunity. Interesting. Well, and kind of going back to the whole health care discussion, I know one thing that um, House Democrats and you and, you know, Senate Democrats were also really hopeful about was there would be enough revenue, uh, maybe not earmarked for health care, but enough revenue, you know, to prop up the general fund if a Medicaid expansion or something like that, the whole all health thing or whatever, <coughs> were to take place because that's been the question, right? Is, is there enough funding long term? Um, is that something that you're going to be pushing for in committee to make sure you have the kind of revenue that may make the governor more comfortable with the revenue for expanded health care? Yes, of course. It will be one of the bargain chips that I will put on the table um, and, and when we go into conference. I want to look out for retirees, you know, for retired teachers. They have that in there. I want to look out for them, give them a COLA, because they have not had a, a raise in years in terms of but they have the contributions that they've given to this state and to this nation in terms of teaching. And I think that they deserve, you know, a COLA. And that was also in the bill. Uh, I want to see infrastructure. I think that infrastructure uh, money is important. Also education, education lottery is going to be a good thing for the state, whether it's a two-year program or four-year program. How will we come together? I think it's going to be good for the state. And also I think that we need to put some money in the general fund also. So. I think that those things, can, all of that can happen. I think that there will be enough money. But if we don't do these things, we're leaving a lot of money on the table. Right now with the bill that the Senate sent down, we may be leaving over about anywhere from five to $800 million on the table based on the bill that the Senate sent down. The, the House bill could in, go anywhere from 800 to a billion dollars in terms of revenue over the years to what we can bring in. So I, I like to think that here in the state of Alabama, our budgets are not always gonna be fat and juicy as they are. We're not always gonna have the federal government to prop us up because most of the opera fund monies and the federal dollars that we're spending now is gonna run out in 2026. And so, yeah, we got some money that's there from the FITNO a lawsuit, but that's going to be gone. That's some one-time money. So if we're going to have some long-term uh, sustainable dollars to be able to do stuff like health care, to deal with some of the problems that we have in the general fund, to make sure that education will continue to get funded so we won't, when we get into those lean years, then I think that we need to pass a comprehensive gaming so we can make sure that that happens. <clears throat> well, we're going to be following that as the session enters its final stretch. We're out of time, Senator, but thanks for coming on, and we'll see you next week. Thank you for having me. We'll be right back. You're watching Alabama Public Television. Welcome back to Capitol Journal. Joining me next is Dick Brubaker, candidate for Congress in Alabama's 2nd District. Mr. Brubaker, thanks for coming on. Well, thanks for letting me be here. I should say former state senator <clears throat> Dick Brubaker. You That's me. You used to come on Capitol Journal in a different uh, context, but I know you're running for Congress. It's the final four, so to speak, right? We're in the primary runoffs. You and Caroline Dobson are running uh, on Tuesday for the Republican nomination for this seat. What has been, now that we've whittled it down to really just two candidates, what has been your pitch to Republican voters to send you, to, to nominate you for Congress? Well, first of all, uh, the fact that I'm the only Republican candidate in this race that actually has lived in the district. 
Uh, and that matters to people. I mean, the fact that, uh, you know, I raised five boys here, ran a successful business, and have just made my life in the what is now the, the new second district. Uh, my opponent didn't get a address in the district till last October. And it's important if you're going to represent an area of the state that you have some idea what the people who live there uh, go through and what their economic needs are, what their governmental needs are, and just what they want from a, uh, a representative. I mean, well, it's one she, thing to grow up in a place, but yeah, if you... She says knew, she has roots in, I guess, Pike County and has a, has a home in Montgomery, so I mean, not from the district? Not said? from it, not at all. I mean, she... My opponent left, when she went away to college, she stayed out of District 2 until last October. I mean, she lived in Texas. It's where she practiced law. It's where she, uh, you know, had her kids. And then she moved to Vestavia when she got a job with an Alabama law firm and didn't get her Montgomery address until last October. So uh, it's one thing, like, I was born in Texas. but And I suppose I could go back to Cameron County, Texas, and say, uh, oh, I have roots here, elect me. But the fact that I lived all of my adult life, chose to raise my kids and run my business in Alabama might make uh, that claim ring a little bit hollow. Okay. And so, you know, it, it, I think it matters what you choose to make your life. Well, we are in the, in the home stretch here, so it makes sense that you're getting a little chippy in terms of pointing out differences between your opponent. Well, you asked me. I know, I know. <laughs> I mean, you yeah, asked, I mean, yeah, What's your pitch? What's your, what, but I want to get back to that. What's All your right. pitch to voters in terms of why they should send you? Well, I know how. You know, I have served, uh, as you know, when I ran for the state senate, I said I'd serve two terms and then I'd get out. And so I served my two terms and then I got out. But what I learned is, and I have proven, that I know how to move legislation through a legislative body. I know how to get appropriations passed when maybe the uh, powers that be are a little bit hostile to the appropriation. Uh, and I, you know, you have to know how to work in a legislative body to be successful. And the learning curve is pretty steep. And so for District 2, especially the way the district's drawn now, uh, it's pretty expansive. It's expansive, and the needs are much more diverse. The old 2nd District was pretty simple. You had agriculture and the military. Yep. The new 2nd District is, let's just say they have a lot more needs, and they're much more diverse. And you, like for Mobile, they have infrastructure projects that have got to get done and done soon. Mm -hmm. And Montgomery just spent $110 million building a container port. Well, that container port's going to be pretty useless if we can't get the containers out of Mobile. And we need to send somebody to Congress who knows how to move those appropriations through the legislative body and get them done soon. Mm -hmm. And if, uh, and I know how to do it. And also, I mean, let's, uh, if you look at my legislative record, I passed a lot of difficult legislation. And I passed legislation that made government smaller, but I also passed legislation that made people's lives better. The Autism Insurance Bill would be one, the Fostering Hope Scholarship Act. I passed the first charter bill that ever passed it out of the state senate. Uh, dozens of school choice initiatives, the Virtual Schools Act, uh, I wrote and passed, the School Governance Act, the, uh, the academic accountability, the first academic accountability bill we ever had in Alabama, I wrote and passed. And there was a lot of opposition uh, to some of those bills. I remember. Well, but we got them passed, and they made schools better. And for the for people dealing with autism, uh, it put a lot of Alabama families in a lot better position than they were before we got that legislation through. Mm -hmm. And those fights are uh, one thing I'm proud of is on some of those fights, you know, they were people that had financed my legislative campaigns, they were on the other side of those issues. Really? And the reason that... Usually you don't like to make donors unhappy. Well, no, you don't. But like on the autism bill, it, it was just a matter of right and wrong. And I knew that, you know, if they were going to be mad at me for uh, giving Alabama families the same sorts of benefits that people in every state that touched us were getting, 
uh, they were just going to have to be mad at me because it was the right thing to do. And for families dealing with disability, it was important. Yeah. Well, let me ask you about the issue of abortion. Well, I, um, I, you know, a couple years ago, I wouldn't have even thought this might be a campaign issue because, you know, but after Dobbs, right. um, after the Alabama Supreme Court's, you know, ruling that threatened oh, the, the IVF. IVF ruling. Oh. And so really abortion has been thrown into the forefront. You had uh, former President Trump felt necessary to come out with a, a statement the other day sort of trying to, to posture himself. So you know this is going to be an issue in the general election. I right. talked to both of the candidates running on the Democratic side. They plan to make it an issue because they, I'm sure they, will. they think they have a, a foothold there. So how would you position yourself on abortion? What would your message be about what Congress should do, what states should do, what limits should be there? What's your posture on abortion? Well, my posture is that the, the great thing about Dobbs is it put the abortion issue back where it should have been all along in state legislatures, not in the federal arena. The Constitution is very clear about what roles the federal government is supposed to play and what powers are reserved to the states. And moving uh, the abortion issue, the Supreme Court just put it back where it had been before Roe in the state legislature. That's where it should be. But as far as the whole pro-life issue, pro-life is a lot more than just abortion. Uh, when I talk about having a pro-life record, I mean things like the Fostering Hope Scholarship Act that I passed when in 2016 uh, that uh, provided uh, foster children with a chance to go to college. The autism insurance bill that we already talked about, that's a pro-life bill. Uh, finding ways to make school choice accessible to parents who aren't wealthy and trying to give their kids the same educational opportunities that previously were only open to families with enough disposable income to send their kids to private schools. You know, all those bills are part of being pro-life. The repealing judicial override was a pro-life bill, trying to make a system more just and that actually uh, affects regular people, but in a way that supports life. Sure. It's a lot more than just, uh, I think a lot of Republicans view it as just an abortion issue and that's it. But pro-life is a lot more than that. But they are, I mean, the, the Democrats are going to point to state laws like Alabama's mm -hmm. that is basically no restrictions. I think life of the mother is the only one. And so they're going to point to that and say, this is extreme. This is Republicans being extreme. Um, so how are you going to respond to those kind of things? Well, I, I'm going to say that what the truth is. And the truth is that, uh, except in my view, rape, incest, life of the mother, uh, to kill an unborn child is wrong. And because it's wrong, and let's, you know, another thing that Democrats always like to say is you can't legislate morality. Well, I would argue that all we legislate is morality. All of our values are reflected in our law, whether you're talking about contracts or whether you're talking about uh, life and death. Those are all issues that have some basis in the moral universe. And, and, and yes, I am pro-life. I don't think that all things being equal, that uh, killing an unborn child is, is a moral act. But at the same time, uh, if you're going to take a position like that, You've got to do things in youth services and foster care and education that give these kids a chance once they're born. And my legislative record uh, is very clear that I have always been supportive of those issues. And like I say, it's a lot more than just abortion. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, you know, sometimes, uh, you know, it is a valid criticism to say that if all you care about is abortion, you're not really pro-life. I mean, because you're, you're just carving out one thing to, uh, to have a prohibition on, and then you just leave it there. Well, that's not a criticism, I think, that can be leveled at me, at least not fairly, if they look, people look at my record. Sure. And, and I think you're right. It's, it's not the only issue. There are dozens, and, but it is going to be in the campaign trail on, in the general election, which is why I thought it was important. Oh, to, it, I to agree with you, and, and they are going to be, when you look at, uh, it's hard for Democrats right now 
to talk about the economy or to talk about inflation because it's Democrat policies that are driving inflation. Runaway government spending, the Democrat policy on fossil fuels, the reason food inflation is so high in Alabama. I mean, eggs are twice as expensive as they were a year ago. Milk, sugar, butter, all up over 20% in Alabama. And that's primarily due not to a problem on the supply side, but on fuel costs because it's so much more expensive to transport uh, commodities like groceries. And that's why prices are up in the grocery stores. And fossil fuel, uh, gas was a buck 85 when Biden took office in Montgomery, Alabama. It's 365 now and for regular. And federal policies that have restricted our energy production is the primary reason food costs are higher in the grocery stores. And so if a Democrat's gonna talk about inflation, uh, he's gonna have to argue for reversal of Democrat policies. Because I don't see many of, my, of the people on the Democrat side of the aisle arguing that we need to control inflation by cutting spending. Well, I hate to say we're out of time, but look, elections on Tuesday, best of luck to you. Uh, we'll, we'll be following it closely and I guess we'll, we'll know that night who the nominee is. And everybody needs to go vote, participate in your democracy. There you go. I couldn't say it better myself. Dick, thanks for coming on. Thanks for letting me come. I enjoyed it. We'll be right back. You can watch past episodes of Capital Journal online anytime at Alabama Public Television's website, aptv.org. Click on the online video tab on the main page. You can also connect with Capital Journal and link to past episodes on Capital Journal's Facebook page. Welcome back to Capital Journal. Joining me next is Caroline Dobson, Republican candidate for Congress in Alabama's second district. Caroline, thanks for coming on the show. Thanks so much for having me. We had you back in when it was the primary. Um, of course, that was back when there were, what, 19, 20 candidates? And right, right. It's been a while since then. We've whittled the race down to mm-hmm. the final four, if you mm-hmm. will. So you're in a runoff with Dick Brubaker. Election's on Tuesday, so here mm-hmm. we are in the final stretch. Let me ask you, what has been your pitch to voters in this primary runoff? Yes, well, I mean, again, just the fact that I am I'm sitting here in this chair with you, I think is largely indicative of the fact that people in this district want an advocate for them. And I'm running to fight for Alabama families. Um, I'm a mom, uh, wife, daughter, lawyer. Until about four and a half months ago, I was a totally private citizen. Um, but my husband and I, raising our daughters here in this district, we're concerned about where the country is headed. We were concerned about our open borders. Uh, you know, the fact that uh, the average family of four in America is paying $950 a month more for basic living costs than we were when Biden took office just three, three years ago. You know, that's almost $12,000 a year more in just three years. Um, The fact that, you know, uh, our children cannot worship God freely, the fact that there's uh, liberal indoctrination in our education system. Um, I'm just a mom who's concerned about Alabama families and I'm so grateful to have this opportunity. Um, And that's what I've been been talking to so many concerned voters throughout this district in large cities and in small communities. Uh, I think also the fact that I grew up in a small town, I grew up in a town of, of less than 200 is really resonating with a lot of voters in this district. A lot of this district is rural communities and small towns, and we don't have enough voices in Washington who recognize the fact that um, so many of these economic policies and trade policies can have a devastating impact on our on our small towns. So I'm running to fight for Alabama families um, here in Montgomery, in Mobile, and everywhere in between, and um, I just am, am committed to ensuring that our kids have opportunities here in this district. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Montgomery to Mobile to Phoenix City. I mean, it's, mm-hmm. it's a very <laughs> expansive district. That's right. Uh, and that's why we wanted to, to, to highlight this. We can't do every uh, district in Alabama, but it's a brand new district. Nobody's ever campaigned in this mm-hmm. district. Nobody's ever voted mm-hmm. in this district. So it's, it's been important. Well, okay, what sets you apart as a candidate from your opponent, Dick Brubaker? Well, first of all, you know, I'm not a career politician. As, as I just said, um, you know, I'm, I'm a real person and there are real problems that we need to solve and we need folks who, um, you know, do have to go to the grocery store day in, day out, are, are trying to provide a better life for their family to understand what's really at stake here. It's so important that Republicans keep control of the House. We're down to a one, one seat majority. So we need to have someone who's a strong conservative, who's a hard worker and a 
strong fighter, not a career politician, someone who's going to stand with President Trump. It's so important that we get Trump back in the White House. It's also so important that we get control of the Senate. But if we lose control of the House, you know, won't, we won't be able to uh, scale back all of the damage that the Biden administration has caused. We, we've got to be energy independent again. We've got to cut government spending so that we can uh, turn the tide on inflation. We've got to close our borders. Um, and we need um, unification to do that. Um, and finally, you know, I'm the candidate that um, Republicans can count on, you know, that won't raise their taxes and that will take voter fraud seriously. Well, one thing your opponent mentioned as a criticism of you, he's, mm -hmm. he basically says that you're not really truly from the district that only mm -hmm. moved here recently. How do you respond to that? Well, it, it's not true. I grew up in Monroe County. I grew up on a farm there. Um, I did go to college out of state, went to law school out of state. I'm grateful that I had time out of Alabama because it made me appreciate what we have here and the value system and hard work and humility that are so emphasized in Alabama. I met my husband in Texas. Uh, we got married and when it came time to start a family, I wanted to be back in Alabama. So I've been back in Alabama since 2019. Um, my husband and I live here in Montgomery. That's where our daughters go to school. Both my daughters were born here in Alabama. And I'm grateful to be raising them here in this district. And actually, you know, I think I have a better grasp of, of, of this district because I've lived in a small town and I've lived in a city in this district. You know, I understand, um, you know, what what a lot of this district, again, rural communities and small towns is facing in this in this economy. Well, I appreciate you responding to that. Uh, let's talk about the issue of abortion, because when I talk to the Democrats, if mm -hmm. you win this primary, you'll be facing, you know, either Shamari Figures or Anthony Daniels in the um, general election. No matter who it is, mm. they're going to really focus on abortion as an mm. issue, just like Democrats are nationally. Mm. Because of the IVF situation, mm. um, because of some of the other, you know, because of the Dobbs mm -hmm. and all that, um, they feel like they have a, a real foothold electorally on that. So how do you posture yourself? I know you're pro-life, mm. but how do you posture yourself on that issue in the general election? How, you, how do you go about talking about it, considering they're probably going to message pretty aggressively on that issue. Mm -hmm. Yes, well, I'm, I'm so grateful for the pre Supreme Court, you know, standing up for life and for states' rights, oh, the Dobbs decision. I, I believe that abortion is a states' rights issue. I'm grateful that the Alabama legislature has, has spoken and so, um, and, and so emphatically, uh, you know, has protected life with um, the pro-life uh, measures that we have here in Alabama. I'm also grateful that the Alabama legislature um, has, has, you know, protected IVF because I think inherently that that is pro-life. I'm pro-life and I'm pro-family. One in six babies in Alabama is born uh, through the IVF process. And I, I truly believe um, that God has given our doctors and scientists um, that wherewithal to allow couples who never thought they could have um, a child that miracle. But I think as Republicans, we have got to go on the offensive on this issue. Um, you know, we have there are Democrats in, in, in states throughout this country that are promoting um, abortion abortion laws that would allow for abortions up to the minute before birth. In 2019, the Born Alive Act um, in the U.S. Senate was up for a vote, and that was basically just saying that if, if a baby was born alive in a hospital for any reason, it was entitled to medical care. Should be a no-brainer. All but two Democrat senators voted against the Born Alive Act. So um, we in the pro-life movement need to stop allowing the Democrats to paint us as extreme. When we're trying to protect God-given miracles, we've got to, to make the public more aware of, of the fact that, that Democrats are, you know, are voting against caring for babies who are born alive in hospitals, are, are promoting, uh, trying to promote legislation in states that would allow for children to be aborted up until the minute before birth. Mm -hmm. You use the word extreme because that, mm -hmm. I think we're going to hear that a lot. They mm -hmm. do. They, they want to paint Republicans as extreme, mm -hmm. but don't they have an argument when it's, you know, laws like in Alabama, no exceptions, mm -hmm. you know, maybe there is a provision for life of the mother, there is. but no rape, no incest, things that President Trump says he supports. So should states like Alabama maybe have a little more lenient laws as, as it comes to abortion? I mean, I know you said it, it should be up to the states, but doesn't that help? Democrats paint Republicans as extreme? 
No, again, I think this is where um, you know we we need to look to um, to to the Dobbs decision in, in allowing states to make that that call on on the amount of protection that they want to provide for life. Um, and, and again, I think you know uh, we we've got to start talking about about what Democrat states are doing uh, or states that are controlled whose legislatures are controlled by Democrats um, and some of the measures that that they're trying to promote. Um, again, that that are. Um, uh, a really, truly, you know, murder of, of children. Hmm. Um, let's talk about just the nature of Congress, because just looking at Washington right now, especially in the House of Representatives, which hmm. you are trying to uh, uh, go and represent, it's just broken. Hmm. Part of that is the slim majority, because hmm. when you have that slim majority, it's just impossible to govern. But there's just a lot of kind of upside down incentives in terms mm -hmm. of you got to there's more there's more reward for fighting for gridlock mm -hmm. for creating spectacles to get viral and send fundraising emails mm -hmm. and things like that so i know one person alone can't <laughs> fix it all but how would you go about trying to be a part of repairing congress to where it can actually function yes well i think that's why it's so important that we uh, that Republicans prevail in the seat. We have got to increase our majority um, so that strong conservatives can demonstrate their backbone and, and, and actually stand up and say, you know, we've got to cut government spending. Um, that is that we will never get inflation under control until we cut government spending. Um, but again, the fact that I'm not a career politician, I think is huge. You know, I'm accountable to the people of this district and I'm going up there to represent them. I'm going up there to fight and work hard. I'm not going up there to tweet or jump in front of a camera. I'm going up there to deliver results to the people of this district. Mm. Okay, well look, we're out of time, but thanks again for coming on the show. Good luck Thank you. on the thanks, campaign right, trail and, and reminding everybody to vote on Tuesday. That's right, right April 16th. Okay, Thank you for right. having me. <laughs> we'll be right back. You can watch past episodes of Capital Journal online anytime at Alabama Public Television's website, aptv.org. That's our show for this week. Thanks for watching. We'll be back next week, starting on Monday at 1030 with our nightly coverage of the Alabama legislature. For our Capitol Journal team, I'm Todd Stacy. We'll see you next time.